Okay. For authors, filmmakers, entertainment, and all your listening needs, listen now to Talk Now Radio, where no topic is taboo. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talk Now Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man. Uh, today, I'm going to be joined by Walter Brooks, and we're going to talk about his book, Life of Christos. And before we get started, I'd like to remind everybody that Talk Now Radio is listener supported. Your donations, your visiting our ads, etc., helps keep us sponsor free and keeps us censorship free at the same time. So don't be bashful about it. And if you guys like to call in and ask any questions, the number is 832-632-7904. And if you want to meet James or ask James any questions a little bit more about him, you can go to um, Facebook and look up Walter Brooks. And i got a link underneath this picture where you can buy his book at Amazon.com. So, uh, Walter, how you doing today? I'm doing well. And, and you? I'm doing better than usual. <laughs> okay, well, that counts for a lot. Now, I was wanting to ask... Now, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, if people look me up as Walter Brooks on Facebook, they're going to get uh, at least nine results because uh, oh. there's 55 Walter Brookses in the United States. So I'm the one in Virginia. I'm glad you threw that in there because that could have been confusing. <laughs> At okay. one point in time, I made a point to invite everyone on Facebook with my name to connect with me. I thought it would be amusing. Hmm. And did they do it? Uh, actually, four of them did. <laughs> so I get these things where it says Walter Brooks posted this or Walter Brooks posted that, and I have to look to see which one it was. be a lot of fun if you four guys got together to the coffee shop. Hey, Walt, how you well, doing, Walt? Doing fine, Walt. How about you, Walt? <laughs> it's amusing because we are all very, uh, very different types of people doing very different types of things. One's actually a comedian. Another is a country singer. And another is just like a normal person who's also actually in Virginia, which might be confusing. So I'm the one in Hopewell, Virginia. And he's in there. In the Hamptons. <laughs> well, usually when I start off a show, I get my guests to tell my listeners a little something about themselves and exactly what interested them in writing about the topic they wrote about. So why don't you tell us a little something about yourself and, and why you wrote your book? All right. The, uh, it's actually right now there's nine books that That's are a part. Yeah, of the Life of Christos series. Okay? All right. I have, I have some other books as well, but that one's a series. And I don't think it matters which book people read or what order they're read in. Though, as always, consecutive order can be more logical. All right? I describe myself as a metaphysician, a spiritualist, and a humanist, okay? I have an eclectic religious spiritual background due to my family. My mother was a Christian scientist. She married a Catholic gentleman, and they had a daughter who was Catholic. So I attended Catholic services also. Then my mother and that gentleman divorced, and she married a man who became my father. And he was Episcopalian. So I attended Episcopalian services also. I had a girlfriend who was an evangelical Baptist. And so I attended those services. And my best friend was a conservative Jew. 
and I was, I guess you could say, honored and privileged to be allowed to attend those services also. My godmother was a Buddhist, and she was also a psychic. And so I attended Buddhist services, and I received psychic training. And I participated in a contest that was done by the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA. And the winner of that contest, which I was, became an honorary member of the Iroquois Confederation, which gave me their spiritual training and also just matters of tribal practices. And so I had that great diversity. And amongst other things, as a child, whether rightly or wrongly, but at least probably controversially, I was getting visions from God, okay? And uh, ultimately, these visions told me that I was Christ and had to tell that to the world. Now, whether or not one believes this is that it was true, what I was being told was true, it was either a blessing or a burden upon me as a child, okay? And I was at least entertained by the visions, which just showed me human pasts and potential futures and paths towards peace. I uh, couldn't get rid of them, one might say. And so at one point in my life, when I was living in Key West, Florida, which is a small island, two miles by four miles. You could say it's a small town, except that it was surrounded by water. So it was really a small town. Most small towns you can, like, get out easily. But I didn't have transportation, and I lived on this island. And I decided, okay, since these visions won't necessarily go away, I am going to do it, okay? And so I've, I've visited some Catholic priests to try to find some help. And ultimately, I started taking notes of my experiences as Christos. And this was talking to people of all religions and spiritual persuasions, incorporating their beliefs and my feedback and their feedback upon me, and also my path in life as a normal or somewhat normal human individual with the nitty-gritty realities of life of our times. And this is what became the Life of Christos series. None of it is fiction. It's all actual events. Okay? So that's the answer to your question. Okay. <laughs> now, by saying you're the Christos, are you referring to the anointing? Because by that uh, definition, anybody who uh, accepts the Holy Spirit would be the Christos. Is that correct? Uh, I'm going to go with words can have many meanings. And to me, Christos is... A spirit. Okay? It's a way of being, and I view it as my own spirit. Which pretty much sounds like what I was saying, at least, you know, pretty close to it as far as I understand it anyway. Uh, and I, I was saying that because I do know that in the Bible, the Christ is considered the anointing of God or the anointing of the Holy Spirit, in other words. So by, oh, yeah, that was, by that definition, by, by that definition, he was the the anointed one, right? Which would be yeah. still be the Christos or the Christ. Yeah, uh, I think that I you know 
one thing that struck me from the Bible, from the New Testament, was when Jesus uh, allowed that well-to-do woman to bathe his feet in oil. Okay? And it was a controversy at the time because it was expensive and he was supposed to be of the people. And why waste this resource in that way when they could use it for food? But I've wondered if perhaps in a way that was an anointing. Because it was when Jesus was physically covered with oil. Neither here nor there. Right? Well, no, actually, I, I do know that back in ancient times, uh, oil, like from uh, alligator oil or skin, is the, well, the common use for anointing. Oil. Back then, in that particular place, it was olive oil. Yeah, what I was referring to was Egypt, but I kind of assumed in the uh, eastern area over there, they were all the same, but that was really an assumption and flawed. <laughs> I guess it could have been either. I've always assumed uh, olive oil. But. Well, I know here in today's world we still use olive oil, but we don't, uh, I mean, we anoint with it, but it's not the same thing as uh, as it meant back then. Back then it wasn't used for anointing and healing as far as I know. At least I never I don't. never read it in the scripture, in other words. Not in that mm-hmm. format or that context is what I'm trying to say uh, that I remember. So tell us about this book, The Chrysler's. I mean, is it, I mean, this series, is this your, um, different teachings that, from things that you've learned down through the years? I would say it's the evolution of what I've gone through. So it reflects a learning process. I have another book, a single book called The Thought of Christos, and that would contain my teachings. Ah. That would be my evolved, polished thought. It was a book that I first put together as a manuscript in 1987. And I have polished it time and time again through the years until I first published it in 2014. Okay? Wow, that took you a while to get it on the market. (laughs) I consider learning to be like going up a ladder and that sometimes to get to the top of the ladder, you have to step up each rung. And that if you show people who are at the bottom of the ladder, uh, the platform at the top, they don't necessarily know how to get there from the bottom, or you don't know where they're at. So to me, the life of Christos still is of value because it is the rungs of the ladder, okay? I've made mistakes in life. I've had errors and flaws, okay? And in part, it is making the mistake and then becoming aware of why it was a mistake that allows you to get up to the next rung, okay? So I sometimes advise people to try to match the age that I was in one of the books to the age that they are now, because it could be that the type of life experiences I was having when I was of a certain age might be most relevant to someone of the same age. There was a time, for instance, when I was taking two-bedroom apartments, renting, and I would rent out one room, okay? And so there are what I might call roommate issues, okay? There are times when I have had a significant other, And so there are love or union issues. There are times when I owned a property. And so there are issues related to what property owners might face in our world. There are job issues, uh, you know, of things I faced 
as a co-worker with a group of co-workers with a unfriendly owner or unfriendly management. There's all kinds of issues. I mean, the book covers a very wide spectrum. They said it covers interactions with all different kinds of spiritual perspectives and realities, and it covers all kinds of interactions with what I call the nitty-gritty realities of life. I think the book is awareness-building and thought-provoking. I think it can be disappointing. I think it can be invigorating. I think it can make people frown, and I think it can make people laugh. Okay? All right. Well, yeah, I think life can do that as well. But uh... Yeah, I think everybody <laughs> can, but I think sometimes people have too many preconceived notions or expectations and they can one thing I have found is that people often approach me blindly with either hate or adulation and either one is wrong yeah I was going to ask you what life became like for you when you first started telling people you were the Christ or the Christ those of you prefer to use it that way when I first, okay, I made a compromise with God at start and said I would go forth as Christos and say I was a living embodiment of the Spirit of Christ, per se, and I would call myself Christos. But I said that Christ is a title and that it should never be self-proclaimed that it is bestowed by the people, and usually that is retrospective, okay? And that I, as an individual, am equal to others as individuals, regardless of loftiness or whatever. We are each parts of a whole society, of a body. And one cannot say that the foot is superior to the hand or the eye to the nose. We all do something of value, okay? So, I went forth as Christos, and part of what I did at start was to seek to find out, well, when I went to the Catholics, I went to some Catholic priests, I was specifically asking if I was being sinful or suicidal, right? which is also in a Catholic view, sinful, but... You know, I said, you know, I can't get away from this. I might want to say as much as I'm being told to do this, okay? So is there anything, have you guys heard anything about this? I mean, it's like if God can push me this way, don't you think he maybe should have, like, maybe mentioned it to you, right? And I got an answer from God on that one which was uh, they've been told, (laughs) you know. And uh, one thing a lot of people think of me today is that I am saying hello, okay, that the Life of Christos series is a great big hello to the world, when in truth I am at the end of my life, and it is a goodbye. And this is what I am leaving behind, and I am giving you a gift of this wealth of experience, all right? And I am probably not going to get wealthy on this, okay? Because I am not going to be here that much longer. But I am leaving you this wealth of learning and experience and an opportunity to the thought of Christos seeks to help people to cope with internal and external negativity in positive ways. I am giving them a toolbox, okay? I am not an escalator or an elevator. You're not going to jump on my back and I am going to take you to heaven, okay? (laughs) I am giving you a path that people will have to walk themselves. Here's the toolbox. Here's the manual. Here's how to use the tools. But you're going to have to do it yourself because that's life. Okay, life is like this giant jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together. But what they don't tell you is that you're going to have to make some of the pieces too, okay? 
At any rate, I really digress, and your question was how people responded to me. Initially, a lot of them assumed I was mentally ill, okay? Or that I was faking it, that I was seeking attention, okay? That I wanted uh, people to give me stuff or something of that nature, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and that passed after about two or three weeks because at least then they didn't think I was faking it. Then they thought I was sick, all right? because it was still going on. It wasn't just a fun thing. And for me, doing this in Key West allowed me to touch people from all over the world because Key West is this great big tourist mecca. All right? It gets people from all over South America, Central America, Europe, Canada, and the United States. Okay? So uh, one of the things I did in my craziness was to walk around the edge of the island. There's a sidewalk and a seawall that goes around the edge for a good bit of it, for, say, two-thirds of the island. And I circled this, just walking it, right? I was letting myself be seen. Yes, God, I am doing it. Don't kill me. You know, how much How much longer do I have to do this, by the way? And uh, when I talked to the two priests, one of them assumed that I had to be high and out of it, Okay. And he told me to sober up and get a bath, which, you know, really didn't help me. And I thought, if nothing else, he should have been more compassionate. He also told me that if there was a second coming, that it didn't concern Catholics because they were saved by the first one. Okay. So this would be for the rest of the world, specifically for non-Christians in that particular Catholic priest view. Right, And that was new to me. I didn't know that. And uh, the second priest, though, he sent me to a second priest. He said, maybe that one will be able to help you. And that one gave me what I call the gift of wonder. Okay? <laughs> no, you it was. what he was talking he, about? <laughs> no. He said he did not know whether or not what I said was true. But that he would wonder. He would leave his mind open to the possibility that it could be so. <clears throat> that priest actually went one step further. And he told his congregation about me. Okay? So, as I walked around the edge of the island, people began gathering in little groups just to observe me. If this was so, then they wanted to at least see it, witness it, be a part of it, and they could, if it ever got attention, they could tell their kids, yeah, I remember that, I was there. Okay? And those people told other people. Okay? So, as I continued walking around the island, I said I was, later on, they got a group called the Guardian Angels, and I said that I started it because... They started then having like a police car somewhat following me around. And I figured that was to protect me. All right. So everywhere I went, the neighborhood was at least temporarily safe from crime. <laughs> right. Because I was a witness. So I later on that guy, I forget his name, but it started with Jose. And he started a group called the Guardian Angels. And what they did was they would simply walk around neighborhoods so that they could serve as fair witnesses or alert police simply to things they witnessed. They would not necessarily do anything themselves other than alert a proper authority or serve as a fair witness, an honest witness in court, if need be. But I say I somewhat started that by doing what I did. At any rate, so the amount of people involved began to grow. Okay. And literally, they were, became like hundreds of people. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, after that yeah. incident with uh, Michael Brown and Ferguson, it sounds like these angels of yours could be used in more than one place around uh, the United States. They are in more than one place, but it takes people have become extremely allergic to doing something, right? I mean, it's, it's basically it's something really for others. <laughs> terrible thing. Yeah. 
So, and I guess a lot of people are scared. But one thing I have said is that if you live like the secret police are going to get you, then you make their job a lot more easier because if there's like a thousand of you, then there's too many of you. But if there's only one or two of you, then they can stomp you down, okay? Which is something else I became aware of because I I went into journalism. And uh, as part of my... Okay, because I was going to save the world, I decided I had to become aware of the world. And uh, to become aware of the world, I started subscribing to magazines from all over the world. And I was going to do a book and call it The Book of Life, right? And my idea (laughs) was that the Bible covered one people through thousands of years. So what I would do is I would cover many, 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 many peoples for about four years, okay? Because I figured that this time period was the first time that technology made instant communication possible so that what we could have would be the perspectives of everyone simultaneously, right? So I could get one incident and view it from all sides, okay? So I started keeping notes and made this thing called the Book of Life. But I started getting ideas, and uh, I like to try to harmonize, to blend, to make peace in areas of conflict to help heal our world, because that was part of my purpose, right? And so I started writing letters to the editor, And I started writing these letters to the editor to publications all over the world, right? And I did some of this as mostly as Walter Books, though I started becoming known also as Walt, J-U-A-L-T, and also as Walt Christos, J-U-A-L-T Christos, right? And uh, uh, this branches out in all kinds of directions, see? So... When I started getting published all over the world, I would keep copies, and I made what some people might call a portfolio, which is a collection of the stuff that I had that had been published, right? And my mother showed some of my articles and my thoughts to a newspaper publisher in her hometown. And he actually offered me a job as a columnist, and I started a feature column, called The Other Side of the Coin, which I said was the middle, right? Because people were always heads or tails. I went with the middle. And I tried to find a common ground between the head and the tail and to make them into one body, right? That holistic, healthy, harmonious approach again. (laughs) Easier said than done. Well, I could do it. Maybe I just have this peculiar talent, all right? I was raised by leaders of the U.S. and world economic, military, religious, and entertainment spectrums, okay? And this is not, so, I like to view myself as just a person, and I generally don't mention this, but I'm going to spit it out this one time, because this is hopefully going to be an archive. Oh, it will. Many people... You're going to get lots and lots and more and more visitors through time, okay? If it pops up as J-U-A-L-T, that's how people search for me, and that's how they can find me, okay? But here it goes, okay? okay. My, my father had five wives. My mother was his fifth wife. My mother had three Husbands. My father was her third husband. Okay? One of my father's former wives was Mary Rogers, which meant that my father's father in law was Will Rogers, the columnist from, who was very well known. And if you go to movie theaters, you'll see them trying to raise money for Will Rogers this or Will Rogers that. But that was his stepfather. 
his uncle married, uh, boy, he, he, if you had two D's in your name, he married her. And he <laughs> married, uh, he did. He married Delphine Dodge. Okay. Delphine Dodge was the only daughter, the only child of Horace Dodge. And Horace Dodge founded Dodge Brothers. Okay. Then people married Doris Duke. Okay. And Doris Duke was the only heir of a uh, Duke Tobacco. She's the one that gave Trump all his money and defended uh, Marcos and did all kinds of things. When she died, she had an estate of $6.6 billion, which was a while back, so she actually had a lot of money. I mean, today, that you quadruple that for what it's worth or even more. <clears throat> now, my father's mother married eight times. Right? These people loved marriage. It was just a thing to do. If they wanted sex with someone, they married them, they had sex, and they got divorced. It wasn't quite that quick, but I think that's how and why it was done. Okay? At any rate, uh, one of the men she married was Heidelberg, who had the printing presses going on in Germany. And uh, another was, let's see, MacArthur, the general. Now, this gets a little confusing because what happened was she was actually married to someone else when she had my father, right? And World War I was going on, and both that Walter Brooks and MacArthur were in Europe. He was doing the Rainbow Division at the time, okay? Now, if the Walter, that Walter Brooks had died in the war, then he might never have had to know anything. But he lived. And so when, as soon as the war was over, she divorced him and married MacArthur <laughs> so that MacArthur could raise his son, who I believe was my father. Okay? Okay. Now, if you go on into the future, there came a point in time where my father had, had four wives and no children, and his mother told him, that unless he had a child, that he wasn't going to get another dime from her, okay? Now, since these other women might have been able to have children at different times and different marriages, and since my father had been unable to have children with any of these four women, then chances are that the actual problem involved was his, right? Okay. Right. So... <laughs> I believe that to keep the genetics intact, okay, he made an, a deal with my mother. My mother was a cover girl model. Her, uh, how does it go? Her grandfather had built the first railroad from St. Petersburg to Moscow, okay? And uh, so they had money. And then the revolution was coming. So they went from Moscow to Siberia into Alaska, and down into California, and they bought an area of land that became known as Haight-Ashbury. Okay? So they helped promote awareness in this country, one might say. All right. So my father's people uh, were from a gentleman named Edward Stotesbury. And Edward Stotesbury was the 50-50 partner of a gentleman called J.P. Morgan who is the Morgan Bank today that is one of the, you know, it's like, say, 90% of the Federal Reserve. All right. Uh, where am I going? So he financed Henry Flagler, who built the first railroad into Florida. So in some ways, it was the big railroad family of the U.S. with the big railroad family of Russia. And my mother being a cover girl model, she in California, my father in uh, I guess Maryland area, and they met in Hawaii, which is funny for a family. My father's family was say out of Scotland. My mother's out of Russia. His came to the New World over the Atlantic. His hers went across the Pacific into Alaska to California. 
He was in Maryland. She was in California. They met in Hawaii, right? And they ended up getting married and living together in Florida. And then they had me in France, right? Which was kind of inconvenient, but that's how it goes. Now, part of this was because he probably could not naturally have children. He turned to his blood father, who raised him, by the way. And uh, so I think that his father was my father, so that my grandfather was actually my father, and my father was actually my half-brother, which explains why he treated me the way he did a lot of the time. Okay, So at any rate, that was some of my background which I haven't mentioned or spelled out in any other interview or in print, except I guess the Baltimore Times got it once. <sighs> and, you know, that was such a digression from your original question. Wasn't that amazing? Yeah. I still remember your original question if you want me to get back to it. But uh, that, was unique inf- that was unique information which will make this interview special. That would definitely make it unique. I'll give you that. Uh, so you you think you got relations with J.P. Morgan, uh, who a lot of conspiracy well, no, theories not, complain not about. Blood, not, blood, not blood relation. My, uh, how does it go? Do, 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 do. My great-grandfather was his partner. Okay, okay, that's right. You said it they was had it. financial relation. They were business partners. They together endeavored to do the stuff they did, but I believe they had a falling out, if you want to get into conspiracy theory, over the Federal Reserve, whereas my side of the family, or my family, you could say, supported individual rights, private enterprise, and uh, diversity. And J.P. Morgan's side supported central control and administration. So that when you got around in the Titanic, one of the conspiracy people will point out to you that most everyone who died on the Titanic just happened to be people opposed to the Federal Reserve. (laughs) (laughs) I heard about that. I also heard, Jill, that um, J.P. Morgan and uh, Nikola Tesla had a big falling out, and that Tesla ripped, uh, I mean, uh, Morgan ripped Tesla off. A lot of people hurt Tesla because he was not approved. I am also not approved. If you were approved, you were part of the printing press economy, okay, which means that you probably aren't working and you have more money than God. Okay? And if you are not approved, and, well, there's a difference between not approved and disfavored. I am disfavored, which means that if I get a job, there's some man in some gray suit who's going to walk in and get me kicked out. <laughs> you know, so I really do depend on income from my books and my art to try to survive in life and from whatever I can do for people around the area I live. But I want you to know their hands are around my neck. And uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, I had what I call four days to live, which means I'm going to run out of cigarettes and be out of money to buy more and I'm going to take pills. Okay, I'm done. I've had had a wonderful life. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Right. But I did get work. And so now the count's back up to 10 days. <laughs> and, uh, now. Where I was at in my rendition okay. was that I was getting published worldwide and that I felt that I had a perhaps unique talent to act as a mediator because of my training as a child, because of my diverse, eclectic, religious, spiritual background, and because also of the people that I had interacted with. I was at the top of the top of the top of the top of our world, Okay. And these people had interacted with me and mentored me, tutored me, trained me, and taught me as a child, okay? So that by the time I would say in my teen years, I had the benefit of the wealth of their life experience. So that I was starting off on my floor of what was their ceiling. 
and I've gone on from there upwards. I am sometimes light years ahead of many people, and a lot of people would be extremely challenged to understand me. And so I make a great effort to use a lot of commas when I write and to speak slowly and with pauses. Well, let me ask you this. How long ago was this that God told you that you were supposed to let everybody know you were the Christos? All right. My first vision was when I was six years of age. So that would have been around 1960. That would be a year after I was born. Right. You're trying to make me feel young. (laughs) Well, that means that it was about 54 years ago. That's a long time. (laughs) Yeah, something like that. (laughs) uh, I was in a church. I was in Bethesda by the sea, Episcopal Church, okay? And in the holiest of holy places, and there I was, and the choir started to come in, and they were singing a hymn, okay? And everybody stood up, the hymnals in their hands, and we were singing, giving God a joyous sound, right? And I was struck by a blinding white light with a booming voice that said, you are Christ, and I was knocked out. Six years old. I came to, I was outside the church looking up. I was on the ground. There was a bunch of adults circling me, looking down. And I looked up at them and I said, why me? And they said, have you, well, did you eat breakfast this morning? So I guess we were talking about two different things. But I want you to know that for all these years, that's continued to help me to smile. Though at the time it didn't, but it has since then. So you went through school telling everybody that you was Christos. Did that create any difficulty? No, for you? I did not. I did not. Oh, okay. I, 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 did, I told a few friends about the visions and things, okay? Okay, that was but an assumption on my part. I apologize few. for that. No, I did not go public until 1978. Okay, I got which you. Which is when I kept started keeping the record, which has become the Life of Christos series. So the Life of Christos series starts when I agreed to do as God asked me to do. And I'm very happy that recently I finished book nine. And why I'm happy about it was because these were typewritten manuscripts, okay? And I spent the time necessary to retype them into a computer and to make them into computerized PDFs and to make print versions. After book nine, I had a computer, okay? Before book nine, I didn't. And for the most part, nobody did, okay? Okay? And uh, so after book nine, most of my material is available somewhere. Some people have it, okay? But the material before them was not available. So by my now having spent the time to make these books available, I have fulfilled my promise to God. I have spent my life as Christos without renouncing myself. I have kept record of my journey and made my experience and my learnings available. And even if nobody on earth reads these books, which some people have, but even if nobody were to, I can face God in good conscience and say, I have done it. I have done it as you asked me to do. And I can even say I am finished. Uh, There's more than I can do with my life, but I've done it. I have done what God asked me to do, and I have finished the work. Right? So you're not good. going to be writing any more books on this series then? Uh, well, I could, but I don't have to. What you have in books one through nine 
is a guided tour where I have polished it and I've put comments in brackets from my perspective today. Okay. These comments in brackets are dated so you can see when they were made, that they were not made at the time. That they are added to the journal. So it's a guided tour. After book nine, it's just raw notes. Okay, they're not polished, they're not edited. And they're just floating around online as PDFs. Okay. I could take the time to polish more, but it's a phenomenal amount of material in that books one through nine cover about 15 years from roughly 25 to 40, between 25 years of age and 40 years of age, okay? And there's much that I did after that. I did a whole metaphysics forum called a forum with no name, which was when really I became known as Walt, J-U-A-L-T, to people of metaphysics, which is and a metaphysic, a forum with no name was open to any and all. And so it has Christians, Wiccans, Pagans, atheists, scientists, everybody and their brother. And it was a place where all these people of all these perspectives conversed civilly with one another and exchanged views and engaged in dialogue. And that was awesome because it showed, if nothing else, that it could be done. Okay. Now, we've got about maybe, let me see, 14 minutes here left. And when it gets to be about that time, I usually like to give my guests a chance to, you know, bring up anything that they'd like to talk about that I haven't thought to ask. All right. Well, actually... I'd have to think about that for a second because I've said so much and I have talked about things that I wanted to talk about. And I thank you for this opportunity to do so. That's what my show's here for. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I let myself often be guided by questions so that I can apply myself to... Uh, what someone else is interested in. Okay, I think I've pretty much told you about what the life of Christos is and uh, aspects of it. I've had great adversity from government uh, for a number of reasons, and the life of Christos does reflect that. And because there was possible conflict and possible disharmony within it, which can be normal in life, I sought to create the thought of Christos, which, as I said, the polished thoughts and teachings, but they're harmonious. They don't embrace the conflicts that my life has had. I have one other book called Writing on the Wall. And if you look on Amazon or Barnes & Noble for writing on the wall, what you'll find is six books with that name. Mine is what I call the long, short autobiography of Walt R. Christos. Because the long, long autobiography is the Life of Christos series. So writing on the wall, or wow, is the long, short autobiography. And it is short. It is very inexpensive. It's seven bucks. And it's written in little words, in big print, and it's simple, easy reading, and it's a breeze to go through, and it basically covers it. And I am working on one today called R's, that's Big R, small s, like R plural. And it's called Rambling Through Spiritual History. And basically, I'm condensing a couple million years of stuff into about uh, 300 pages, written in the same format as WOW. So it is small words, big print, easy reading. And that one should be out in another nine or ten days. Or if you're listening to this interview, three years from now, then it's already out somewhere. 
they might be listening to this here three years from now. <laughs> I mean, right I now think- I'm putting all my shows up on YouTube. I'm putting them on my site and some of them even at Daily Motion. So, uh, and uh, other people are getting them and putting them on the, their site. So it should be around then. <laughs> Yeah, if you use a keyword of, of Walt, J-U-A-L-T, it's like Juan, but Walt. I was working in a lumberyard in Key West, and I was the only Anglo. And uh, of the Hispanics that I worked with, one had come in on the sea lift, because he had been, a, I guess he served as a sergeant in Angola for Castro, and then he got tired of it, and then he came over here in the sea lift, and he could not pronounce the letter W for anything, all right? So he could not say Walt. And uh, so I went on a wall with big chalk and put down J-U-A-L-T. And looked at him and said, it's Walt. It's like Juan. Got it? J-U-A-N. Juan. J-U-A-L-T. Walt. And then he could say my name. And I kept it. So if you use that as a key word, then people will be able to find people look for me as Walt because it's not all that common, though. Apparently, a shoe company in Indonesia now has a whole brand of shoes named Walt. So people can walk in my shoes, except that they're not my shoes. But they decided that I might get popular and they like the name, too. But other than them, it's only been me. So if you put that in through time, it's going to be a snowball effect where more and more people will get it. Because my my books really are all for all people. Uh, you don't have to be religious or spiritualist, uh, but you can be. And uh, it's just an interesting story. Okay? Okay. Now, do you have any last-minute thoughts for everybody? Uh, offhand, no. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I hope that something I do will be helpful to you. Will help you to laugh or to smile or to grow in a good way or just to cope with life. Alrighty. Also, now everybody, come see me this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. August the 20th. I'm going to interview William Hall. And his book is The World's Most Haunted House. Uh, it was the Lindsay Street Haunting. I've been reading some of it over the last couple of days. And uh, they had a lot of activity in that house. It looked to me like more than the activity they had in The Conjuring, the movie. So this guy had a lot to go on here and had a lot of witnesses in it. A lot of poltergeist activity he's going to talk to us about. And he's been researching this case with the actual police and witnesses and people of the time that were there. And uh told about everything he found in his book, in other words. So that should be interesting. If y'all want to reach um, Walt, uh, you, what's your Facebook profile? Is that uh, Walt with J, uh, J-U-A? No, or? that's Walter with that's Walter with a W. But if people want to find me, they should look for Walt, J-U-A-L-T. And because uh, I have art on Facebook. And that'll bring you to my site. One way or another, it'll help you to find me. You'll get more results than you thought possible. Okay. Did you ever think about going by Walter with a J-U-A? Well, that's why I write as Walt R, no period after the R. After the R. It's Walt R. Christos, because if you say Walt R, you get Walter. Ah, uh, okay. I thought that might be a little cheap, a little bit unique, you know what I mean? <laughs> it is. Well, there's all kinds of reasons. There was a book that was lost called Q, or Cuella, which was a collection of sayings of Jesus. Right? I read that and book, was, Q. And so I did R. And plus, Q is quite, you know, R is response, and there was Q on... Picard and Next Generation, I thought I'd go with R. R can be R as in O-U-R, so it's Walt R. Christos, and it gets people to say it, which is kind of nice. Anyway. Well, <laughs> I, have a, I have a great sense of humor, okay? Right. I was going to say, that book Q that you mentioned, 
I found that mm-hmm. one in a local library here, and I checked it out and read it. So if anybody's interested, it's kind of like the Gospel of Matthew. As a matter of fact, many people think Matthew uh, used it as a source book for his uh, book. Yes, they do. They do. I heard it was lost. I didn't know that there's a version of it around. I, actually, I heard the same thing, but I swear to God, I had it in my hand from the library. And I, I read afterwards on, on the Internet that it was lost, and I'm like, then how do I have this in my maybe hand? Someone put together, maybe someone put together what they consider to be a modern version of what it could have been. Because if it's a collection of the sayings of Jesus, then all they would have to try to do to make a modern version would be to call through everything that's ever been attributed to Jesus, put it together that way. Well, they pretty or much... maybe, you were, maybe you were having interdimensional shift, and while it was lost in one dimension, it's been around forever in another. <laughs> well, I was think, also noticing that what they did in this here book was it had the, the teachings of Jesus in, in it in that, from the Matthew, but it did not have the... Um, the birth, it didn't have the, uh, you know, uh, the childhood narrative in the house or the p- kids at the manger. It didn't have the crucifixion. It, it was just nothing but the teachings, you know, raw material. Yeah. Well, that would sound more like Matthew because uh, it's too long a topic if you want to go into the whys and wherefores of the first four the first. Of the four Gospels, all right, because uh, most people think they all came from apostles, all written about the same time, put together one book. And they all had different authors, were written in different places, at different times, from different perspectives. Exactly. And, uh, so they had different values and different focuses. And yeah, each one was focused the on a value certain... of any of them. Yeah. Each one of those synopsis were uh, focused on a certain group of people, and it was written for their, to tickle their ears, in other words. Yeah, and I think they, one of the reasons, for instance, they say Matthew ends with the, uh, the coffin and wondering why, and that was related to how the Jews or the people <clears throat> felt after the destruction of the first temple. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, well, I show that we've come up on the end of the hour here. Um, like to thank everybody for listening in. If you, that's all you did was listen, well, you still participated and I appreciate it. Can't have a show without my listeners anymore and I can have one without a guest. So you folks don't forget to come back and tune in, uh, to me Wednesday here at www.talknowradio.net. And don't forget to come to Revolution Radio every Thursday from 1 to 3 p.m. And uh catch my show that I do over there. In fact, this coming Thursday, I'm going to be uh, talking to Mike Barra. And we're going to discuss his newest book, Ancient Aliens on Mars 2. And then um, from 2 to 3, I'm going to be talking to Rob Skiba. And his book is Archon Invasion. And it deals with the Nephilim and the end of time. And it should be an interesting conversation. And that's from 2 to 3 because Mike told me he can only handle one hour. So I scheduled two guests to cover the full two hours. Look forward to seeing you guys there. And um, Revolution Radio is also listener supported. With that, I'm going to leave you all to your uh, weekend and hope to see you Wednesday. Y'all have a good day. Take care and bye-bye, folks.